examination in court. And thank you. Thank you, Charles, for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for coming on this update, set, uh, update talk. And uh, my talk this afternoon is just based on you know work that was funded in, in three states, you know, uh, on enhancing the efficacy of biocontrol and reducing the aflatoxin contamination and cost. And in that regard, I wish to thank my co project. Uh, we have Gary Payne and Ron Hennifer at North Carolina State, Kira Bowen and Austin Hagen at Urban University, and then we have uh, Robert Kimmer at the University of Public Services, uh, was a um, master's project and actually we penetrated quite a lot in Harding, different people in different states, capturing those differences in the environment. So just to start, uh, you know, uh, aflatoxin corn, as far as it's concerned, you know, it's caused by primarily members of aspergillus section whereby, and this includes uh, parasiticus, pneumias, and aflatoxin, you know, we have L and S strengths. And of these three uh, species, aflatoxin uh, seems to be the most important as far as corn is concerned. And just this is a, a corn here showing this correlation of aspergillus flavors. And we know very well that you know stress factors you know, such as drought and insect damage during the season have uh, uh, predisposed many for the infection by the flavors. And so whenever you have high levels of drought or high levels of insect damage, you know, these are always a, a good positive correlation between those two. And we know very well also the most the reason why we care so much about aflatoxin is the effect uh, it has on both animal and human health. We know uh, it's, it does has some adverse effect, uh, and we know very well that in Africa it has been demonstrated that you know children fed to uh, contaminated grain have you know the retarded growth and development, and uh, because of that you know there are there are regulations as far as how much is allowed to be in the uh, maize sample, and this is about 20% of the area overall. So whenever you have more than that, you know the whole you know process gets infected. Just an example, this is one of my classical uh, images that I like showing as far as after toxins from sun. These are labels, you know, uh, from chickens that have been fed to uh, contaminated corn. And over here you have the health labor, and as you increase the uh, level of toxin within the particular feed, you can see that liver slows and brain increases. Just the dramatic effects of what after toxin can do as far as, you know, uh, uh, the whole thing is after the sun. And then if you look at management, you know, we have very limited options. You know, we have cultural practices, you know, post resistance and, and biocontrol. But in our opinion, I think if you look at the three, the three, you know, biocontrol offers the you know the greatest potential as far as you know reducing aflatoxin contaminated corn. Now there have been a lot of progress, you know, starting the post pathogen resistance, you know, interruptions and these are cultural practices, but these are very variable depending on, you know where you're doing your experiments from. They're not, they're not very consistent. And there's, you know, that correlation between, for example, you know, uh, plant intensity and, uh, and, and the reduction in effort of contamination so is actually dependent on so many other factors. But uh, if you look at just carefully, you know, with what I've been saying in terms of the data value, you know, we see that biocontrol, you know, over the greatest potential as far as uh, mitigating effort of contamination. And as far as biocontrol is concerned, I think we know very well that variability, you know, in you know, our production production is actually the key, you know, uh, in terms of, of biocontrol. We know we have that the toxin profiles vary. You know, we have the atoxygenics that don't produce the toxin at all, and then we have the toxin producers, you know, and the atoxygenics can actually be used, applied in the season uh, to competitively exclude you know, the toxin producers, thereby reducing the amount of toxin being formed. So this approach has been used to produce you know, our commercial birth control agents in you know, the United States and as far as under, and in Africa too. So we have Aflagar, not in the end, but six from Arizona, and then we have Aflas, you know, uh, in Africa. And this Aflasev was recently developed by the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, which is vital. So what was the basis of this particular you know, proposal? And this came out from some of our observations of what's happening out there in the field. You know, we, 
we, we, we observe that there's a lot of variation in you know, the, uh, the effect of viral control. For example, if you look at you know, North Carolina, for example, Africa does much better compared to AFS6. So our feeling was that you know, that's, you know, the variability in the natural population of F, of, uh, F levels or the members of section flavor influence the effect of viral control. So we wanted to investigate this, you know, because we didn't have any data to support or dispute what we thought was going to happen. And so our working hypothesis was that if you match the viral control agent with the uh, with the uh, with the soil population that is similar to the viral control agent, then <coughs> the figures might really go up. In other words, if the viral control is similar to the uh, what's in the soil during the growing season, it's taken up sort of going to compete much better, you know, uh, with the oxygen strength. And by doing that, then we can actually uh, significantly reduce the amount of contamination. So that was a working hypothesis for this particular run. So our objective was therefore to establish, you know, the impact of the native populations of members of section thereby on the effects of viral control, primarily as uh, we were testing AFX6 and after that uh, in this regard. And we wanted to see to what extent those the native population actually does in fact uh, influence the uh, aflatoxin contamination uh, within the corn. So the experiments were done in three states, just like I said at the beginning of my, uh, my talk, you know, we had Alabama, Georgia, and North Carolina, and we had seven treatments total. You know, we had three treatments uh, of eight or six different application rates, as far as even also after that three uh, application rates. And then we had uh, the antibiotic control, and this was applied at a task. And each of those experiments had four applications. And we, since we wanted to see the impact of population structure or the genetics within the soil, we collected soil at different time periods. You know, we, we had a baseline data where we collected the soil before the application of the biocontrol, and then one week after the application of the biocontrol, and then also we collected the data uh, at harvest. It's just a schematic showing you know, how the samples are collected. And we have 20 samples total. The red are the ones that the collect soil was collected before, you know, uh, after the fire control. Uh, the green one is where the soil is actually collected after the fire control. And also collected soil uh, at harvest. So uh, this is just a picture showing you know, uh, the corresponding treatments with where the soil was collected. But we wanted to see. Does, for example, uh, when you have a certain set of you know, uh, members of section of flavor at point A, does that correlate with the, uh, with the treatment that was applied? You know, uh, for example, you see differences whereby after that was applied compared to uh, uh, AFX6 or the control, for example. And to what extent do those differences in, term, in terms of the application rate influence uh, this, uh, the genetics of the soil and the toxic contamination at the after? Just taking some of the images that we took, it's just a picture showing uh, uh, the corn almost just before uh, they have, uh, we collect the soil before the application of the biocontrol in the Rocky Mount of Carolina. This set was another, another graduate in my lab, and we have this is Greg O'Brien who works with the okay. And this is just another image just after the biocontrol was applied. We collected the soil just after one week after the biocontrol was applied. And this is at harvest. Uh, this is Mary Lewis, this is the graduate student in my lab that's actually doing all the work you know, in terms of collecting the soil samples, phenotyping, and, and phenotyping the, the, uh, the strains. And for mo most of you who are aware about uh, a plus in soil in terms of genotyping and phenotyping, there's actually a lot of work. And she spends a lot of time in the lab trying to figure out what's air and air and what's uh, parasitic as anomia. So it takes a lot of uh, training for a graduate student, but we have a master student. Like that. And then finally, this is one of the some of the images you know, we got you know, showing insect damage and harvest in the head, that of sporulation. We don't know whether this is actually the flavor or not. Just look like look like that. Peter, did y'all do any inoculations or anything? No, we just applied naturally the uh, natural natural application. We didn't do really any. Alright. Um, so the first thing that we did, you know, we, since we want to get this, uh, we want to determine uh, the, the phenotype within the soil, we have to go through the same four process. Do soil dilution, serial dilution, come up with a, a you know, a dilution level that actually is optimal to identify uh, members of the aspergillus section flavor. So when we started with the one to six dilution, we 
we've got very few currently shot now, but none of them were actually to play us. So we went to one of the two dilations, we got some, as, 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 but of course we realized that uh, they, they were not based on our previous studies, you know, we were only getting off of numbers. So finally, our optimum dilution level was actually one to one. We were able to see colonies that are typical of uh, aspergillus. And we really, at this point in time, we didn't know whether they are LOS or parasitic or non -less. So besides section flavor, I also observed, you know, members of section life, you know, we had few gutters and, and uh, terrorists that are actually present in you know, some. So we had a very diverse, you know, uh, uh, soil colonies for different members of aspergillus. So um, just like I indicated before, I mean, we know that if we want to enhance biocontrol, you know, our hypothesis is that can we match you know, the biocontrol to uh, what's up in the soil? And hopefully we can, we can get it to a better job. So the first thing that we did, we wanted to see, okay, uh, within the soil, you know, what do we have? We have parasiticals, we have normals, we have LLS. So by, just, by phenotyping, we found lots of variation, variability, because we cannot really tell what's happening. You know, there were some that had green to yellow centers, you know, and whitish edges, you know, some were green pretty much all over, all over the place. So you cannot really tell what's the uh, yes. So we went uh, forward actually now to genotype you know, this, and this, uh, this is just a gel image of the amplification of the TRIPC gene that we use to identify different members of section flavor. And they were typical of the band of about 550 base pairs. This is a a negative control just water. These this two strains are F levels, you know what they are. And the remaining are all samples that we collected from the soil and uh, expressing that particular band. And so we went ahead and actually determined, you know, using that trip gene, you can actually uh, determine individuals that are L, S, non S, and citrus. And so this is for the pre biocontrol application sample. This is a sample that the, the biocontroller have not yet been you know, applied, kind of like the baseline. In North Carolina, all of them turned out to be air. So we didn't get an S, we didn't get any parasiticals and omics. And we are still working the samples from Georgia and Alabama. You know, um, she's been working very hard to get this going. But uh, we expect to see a little bit different picture there, you know, because based on previous studies, you know, we have you know we have the force of S showing up in, in Georgia or Alabama, for example, parasiticals. So we expect a different scenario, although that's not completed yet, but we expect them to be a little bit different from what we have uh, in North Carolina. So looking ahead, what's, what's still remaining to be done? Okay, we have to still, we have a lot of work to do. We have to complete the phenotype of the soil samples, the pre, the post, and the harvest. You know, uh, that's going to take the lifetime of the crisis when we get it completed. And then after that, we have to do a uh, our complete our after toxin analysis, we're actually doing that right now. We have completed the soils, the samples from North Carolina. We're going to do the same for the samples from Georgia as well. And try to relate those. You know, the critical thing is to relate different treatments. You know, uh, the toxin concentration, the uh, uh, respective treatment of the biocontrol, L36, and, uh, and after that. Because our best one what we observe, you know that in North Carolina, <coughs> After that, that happened much better job from the FSC. And we wanted to relate those to uh, the population structure within the soil. So we'll com complete our genotyping you know, uh, to delineate you know, specific uh, species of within the section flavor, LS, and uh, normias and parasiticals. And once that is completed, you know, we'll have to relate that to the figures of the individual uh, biocontrol agents by looking at the uh, the relative, you know, reduction in the aflatoxin contamination within the corn. Based on what we have been able to determine, you know, air flavors does fall into three clades. You know, we have the, the A1 clade, A, B, and A, C. The A1 are primarily those individuals that produce both the CPA and aflatoxin. And the A, B clade is the one that don't, don't produce the aflatoxin, but they produce CPA. They don't, they don't also produce CPA. And that's where aflatoxin lies. And the AC clade is those individuals that don't produce apatoxin but produce CPA, and that's where FS6 is. So by phenotyping these individual uh, soil populations, you can actually group, eventually put them in different clades and see, okay, if you have, for example, most of your staff in both in clade B, for example, the expectation there is that you are, you are better off applying FS6. 
I mean, sorry, every there are all applied after that. But what if the soil composition comes out with primarily individuals falling within the one C clay, then our hypothesis says that if you apply F by six, then you get a much better control compared to if you apply after that. So the, the whole point therefore will be now, can we match individual uh, biocontrol agents to what's happening actually in the soil? And if we do that, our expectation is that we'll be able to substantially reduce the amount of after the pump within the panels. All right, last but not least, I wish to make some thanks to individuals that have tried in helping in this work. Uh, my graduate student, Mary Lewis, has been very diligent in getting the phenotyping and phenotyping work. We also work in closing with Nacho Carbon and Bruce Horn, who have been very helpful as far as phenotyping you know, and phenotyping you know, is concerned. My undergraduate students in my lab, you know, Barbara Stevens and Seth Watkins, Greg O'Brien, the lab manager, who will be very pain, and of course, I'm um, for providing the funds for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? So once we uh, once we see something uh, a pattern of trend, you know that you know it's considered some of our hypotheses, we can always go back to the canvas uh, and isolate what and find out what it is within the canvas itself and see to what extent what's in the canvas corresponds to what we have looked at. And in, in the same vein as your hypothesis matching what's in the soil, she doesn't if, match what's in the canvas. Perhaps maybe I would say even more important is what's in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from your corn isolations, how often do you isolate species other than flavors, the parasiticus and the other one you mentioned? What, what's the frequency you find? That, do you that, have any frequency data? Or? Well, that varies depending on where you are. For example, in North, in North Carolina, um, we, we, parasitica is always there, maybe less than, it's about 10 to 15 percent of what you get is parasitica. Uh, the frequency of S trend, for example, of flavors is pretty less than one percent, and most of what you observe is actually that. But if you, like, I did some work in Africa, you know, they, 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 you see the reverse happening. You find a lot of parasitic in Africa, for example. You have different section flavors, I mean, different strains like SVGs that we call called P and G, you know. So it just depends on where you are. Do you find any of your uh, isolates and flavors that don't mix with it? So far, no. Most of what we most most of what we have, the uh, what we expect from the kernel themselves, they the ask for us. But we have not really looked at that case. So we were surprised with corn isolates. We didn't find many. Yeah. I realize it's probably beyond the scope of your project, but uh, just anecdotally or observationally. Do you see any correlation with uh, biocontrol for flavus with other mycotoxigenic fungi, maybe particularly Fusarium verticillioides and Fumonisins? Well, uh, well uh, right now we don't look at that yet, but I, I think you make a very good point. I mean, I think uh, uh, it would be useful to find if there's any correlation at all, because, you know, both, like Fusaria, I mean, the contamination in corn by alpha doesn't apply in isolation. We have phenomenon and also which is a major problem too, and it would be very useful to see it obviously. But I, I really don't know the answer to that. The aphrosite that's in that's used in yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us what the difference is between it and Aphrodard and the AF thirty six. Well I mean the only difference is that you know the the biocontrol A is it's actually a mixture of four strengths of A flavors and they're all air strength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So four strains. Yeah, but it's only that the native, the native, isolated native from Nigeria, that's the only difference. You know, but uh, as far as uh, the, uh, you know, the DNA is concerned, you know, <coughs> the expectation is that, you know, Alphagas, for example, genetically, if you look at them, uh, they, they, have, they don't have a cluster to make the Alphagas. You do the same too with you know, the strains in Africa. But distinctively, I mean, they are all, they don't use the toxin, you know, uh, this should <coughs> might be similar. Yeah. 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 Yeah
for that instance. They all have flavors, you know. So. But the only the only difference is that those are native strains. You know, um, the isolated from Nigeria, you know, uh, when when I was there, I have to do that actually. And it's it's a mixture of four of those strains. You talked about the strain you didn't find and you did find. It. Right. How, how how do we communicate? How how are you know can you work on it and others work? How do you communicate it across the corn growing areas? The strains that are found in different states, different regions. Is there a communication? How, how does that work? Well, I mean, as as far as you know, growers, you know, I. I, I buy a phone, you know, uh, pretty much. I just want to make sure the phone works when I make it. That's not why. But uh, we, we tell uh, we educate our growers, like in North Carolina, for example, uh, we tell them what we have. You know, there's a lot of diversity, you know, in terms of the uh, members of certain flavor. You know. But they're typically, parasiticals, for example, it's more in the south, uh, Georgia, it's more associated with, with, with the peanut. Um, so up north, they're all pretty much there, you know, L's, friends, you know, we have a few S. But I, I don't know how that's important, how important that is to grow us, you know, to tell them, okay, if you have parasitic or or uh, you have L, uh, I don't know how much important that is to them. All they want to know is that when you try to solve the problem, and you, is there a person going to be there, or make a problem next year, they're, much, they're not so much concerned with the different species. You know. But for us, it's important because you know, uh, most of what we have in terms of biofuel, most of those are air. They tend to come out of air. Yes. Can I comment on that? Sure. Uh, I think you touched on a very important point there because the, the way a lot of these things, I think, are classified by what they do is compatibility. Mm -hmm. It's strange. Yes. Yeah. And, um, Dr. Horn at uh, Georgia has a, a number of testers for these, and he's been very willing to share them. And uh, I think it would be very helpful if uh, in each of our states we had uh, those testers and the labor to uh, define what the population structure is with regard to DCG and all of our states that suffer contamination. I think that uh, that's a pet peeve of mine. It's got other ramifications, but I'm going to those <laughs> Right. I mean, no, the reason I ask the question right. is in working with, <coughs> originally when the Apple Guard was working on their label, AF36 working on their label, you see AS questions like that in the labeling process, and it didn't seem like it was readily available. I just wondered if that a little crazy. It's, it's a it's a hard process to do VCG analysis. It's a lot of work, but most a lot of the work is making the testers. And I think Bruce has about seventy of them. And seventy. Yes. Among our isolates, we've got a lot of ours that don't match any of this. So we've got more. You know, Peter Cowley's got a bunch of them. So if, if somehow. Uh, all these collections of testers could be amalgamated and shared, it would allow population structure assessment right. across the Gulf side. But one thing I want to also comment, the comment on the kind of PCGs. The PCGs are also evolving. They also evolve in their chain. Yeah. And because of that, I mean, you have to keep keep doing this yeah. Yeah. in year out just to maintain yeah. that information. And well, it's a lot of work and time and effort. Because the population is changing, and I guess the VCGs, the sexual process, can change too. They can change too, yeah. 